Good morning. Welcome. It's great to have you with us in worship today at Bethel Baptist Church. Uh, thanks for joining us for our online service. Just a quick announcement this morning as we begin our time together. Uh, we are collecting Operation Christmas Child shoe boxes uh, to take and, and to donate to send across the world with Samaritan's Purse this Christmas season. Um, that collection day is, is today here at church. Uh, but if you are, are not able or have not been able to drop off your shoebox, uh, give the church office a call. Uh, I would love to come by and pick it up uh, if you need me to do that. Uh, also, we could, could set up a time for you to run it by the church office this week as we collect those uh, to send. And pray for those shoeboxes that Bethel sends out that God would use them to encourage uh, boys and girls around the world, uh, not only with a Christmas gift, but with the hope of Jesus Christ. I want to share with you some verses out of Psalm 113 as we begin our time in worship to this morning. The psalmist writes, praise the Lord, praise, O servants of the Lord, praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. And that's what we declare today from this time forth. Forevermore, for all of eternity, from the time the sun rises till it sets, it is always the right time to praise the Lord. So I'm, I'm thankful that you are uh, worshiping with us today, and I pray that that would be the focus and direction of our hearts, would be to honor and praise the Lord uh, in everything that's done and said here today. So join with me in prayer and ask God to bless our time together. God, we thank you so very much. Uh, that we can worship you, Lord, from this time forth to forevermore. Lord, from the rising of the sun to the setting. Uh, Lord, we just want to declare your worth and your glory and how good you are. Lord, we want to, to stand and shout and proclaim, Lord, that you are above all, that we love you. And, and Lord, we, we want to follow you and seek you in all that we do and say. So God, I ask that our time together here today in worship, Lord, that you would bless it. God, that you would speak into the hearts and lives of your people. That God, as we worship you, you would be glorified with the sweet fragrance of our worship. As we spend time in your word, Lord, that you would use it to transform our hearts and lives to be more like Jesus Christ. God, I thank you for what you're going to do in the hearts and lives of your people at Bethel and online today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. <laughs>
If you've got your Bible this morning, go ahead and grab it and turn to the book of James. We're going to be in James chapter 5. Last week, uh, James encouraged believers as they face trials, as they go through life's difficulties, as they face tough situations and circumstances and people, James encouraged them to approach those trials and those difficulties by being patient and, and by establishing their heart, that their heart would be rooted and grounded in the return of Christ and their relationship with him. James also said, as you face those difficulties, um, don't grumble, don't complain, but instead be steadfast. Realize that God has a purpose and God wants to use those trials to build a strong and growing and living faith in you so that you can bear up underneath those trials. It's a picture of strength and stability and how that, that the trials and difficulties of life produce that strength and maturity in our faith. Well, as we get to, to the last half of, of chapter five, James kind of, he starts making some closing remarks uh, to tie some bows on the letter. All right. So there's a little change, a little transition uh, as James gets to these closing thoughts. And today in chapter five, verse 12, uh, James, again, speaks about the tongue or speech that we use or or the way that we talk. James has addressed speech throughout his letter. In each chapter, James um, very specifically addresses the words and speech that believers use. In chapter one, he says, if anybody claims to be religious, but you don't bridle your tongue, you're really only deceiving yourself. In chapter two, James talked about a professed faith or claiming you have faith, but then there not being any works at all that accompany that faith. And James says, hey, if there's that disconnect between what you profess and say and the way that you live between faith and works, there's a problem. There's an issue. And then in chapter three, James spent a lot of time on the tongue and the importance of controlling the tongue. James used several examples, illustrations. He, he used the example of a, a bridle and a bit in a horse's mouth, the rudder on a ship. James also, uh, considering the damage and destruction that the tongue can cause, talked about a spark and how just a small spark can set up ablaze an entire forest. James talked about how uh, we use duplicitous speech. It's kind of talking out of both sides of our mouth, all right? Um, the example he used, he says, with your tongue, you praise the Lord, you bless God, you worship him, but then you turn right around and you curse your brother or sister or mankind. And James says, look, that that disconnect, that that dichotomy of the tongue to to worship God, but then curse others. He says that shouldn't be. You're a follower of Christ. There should be consistency in your speech. We see that again in, in chapter four, verse 11, where James he says, don't speak evil against one another. He's talking about slander. And a lot of times we use our, our tongue to put others down in order to build ourselves up or to feel better about ourselves or make ourselves look better. James says, as a follower of Christ, it shouldn't be. Last week uh, in going through trials, James says, do not grumble. Do not complain against one another all right, or against the Lord. So, so with our mouth, we can, we can grumble, we can complain, we can be negative, we can whine, we can want to throw a pity party. James uses the tongue throughout his letter because it is, it is easy for us to gauge and see with our speech. Everybody talks and our tongue is going to, it's going to give evidence and show what's really going on. Remember, John MacArthur said the tongue is a tattletale. You know, uh, the tongue, no matter what's what's said or claimed or professed, the tongue actually is going to show it's going to going to open the windows of what's really going on on the inside. And that's what Jesus says in Matthew 12, 34. Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So the tongue is going to reveal and give evidence to what's really going on on the inside. Today, James is going to address a, a pattern of speech, a pattern of behavior that we're probably going to be able to relate to and, and understand. We're going to be able to recognize it within our society. So if, if you're to James chapter five, let's read verse 12 together. For context today, uh, we've just talked about how James has addressed the tongue throughout his book. And then he kind of wraps a lot of those things up here in verse 12. James writes, but above all, my brothers, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath, 
But let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. Let's pray. God, I ask that your word would be strong and mighty, that it would break down um, just patterns of speech. Lord, the way that we use our tongue uh, in Lord, ways that we shouldn't. I pray that you would just break those things down with your word today. Help us to see the truth in your word. Help us to understand the importance of, of our, our patterns of speech and the way that we communicate, the things that we say, the things that we talk about, the um, great importance of alignment between the things that we profess and claim and the way that we live. God, help there to be consistency in our speech. I pray that your Holy Spirit would guide and do a great work in the hearts and lives of your people today, that we would be challenged and encouraged. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. James starts out right here in, in verse 12. He says, but above all, all right, but above all, my brothers, there's a little bit of, of disagreement and, you know, um, scholars, commentators, they try to figure out how that fits into the context of what James is writing you know, but I, I think that it's very faithful to say, but above all, look, I've talked about the tongue in each chapter. OK, and, and now I'm going to kind of summarize the tongue a little bit and the way that we use the tongue above all. This sums it all up to help you understand the tongue. And James says, but above all, my brothers, do not swear. This swearing that James talks about, he, he's not talking about using four letter words that your mom or grandma says that you shouldn't use. OK, he's not talking about filthy or vile language. He's not talking about uh, unwholesome speech. That's that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about taking oaths. All right. Or, or making vows. A lot of times people will take this verse and and take it out of context and say, well, uh, you know, I'm told clearly right here that I shouldn't take a vow, that I shouldn't take an oath. All right. And, and they go through life not taking, uh, making vows or, or taking oaths, but that's not really, that's not what James is saying either. Okay, so it's not talking about an oath in court if you've ever seen in, in TV or, or been in the courtroom. Uh, maybe you've even had to place your hand on a Bible and say, uh, you know, I promise to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help me God. James isn't talking about that kind of oath. James isn't talking about an oath that we make at a wedding you know, as, as we take vows at a wedding and we say, I, you know, I promise to love you forever, uh, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health till death do us part. All right. That that oath, that's not what James is talking about. Instead, he's talking about oaths. And I'm going to use some examples uh, of phrases and things that, that I have heard and, and said myself. Yeah, these are the kind of things that he's talking about. I don't know if you've ever used the phrase as a kid. Well, I swear on my grandma's grave. All right. That's supposed to be an oath to say, no, hey, I, I'm telling the truth. I'm not lying right now. I am telling the truth. It's to prop up the things that we say. Or, uh, you know, I don't know if you've ever used a pinky promise. My girls love doing that with me. You know, I'll tell them, I'll say, well, this or that. And they'll say, well, do you promise? And I say, yeah, I promise. And they'll say, well, daddy, do you pinky promise? And, and we'll, we'll lock pinkies. And I'll say, yes, I pinky promise. But the idea and thought is, is, is that pinky promise gives greater weight and, and more truthfulness to the things that I've said. I don't know if you've ever heard the phrase, cross my heart, hope to die, stick a needle in my eye. OK, there were times where as a kid we would 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 tell a lie or maybe it was the truth and, and wouldn't be believed. And we would say, hey, cross my heart, hope to die, stick a needle in my eye. You know, it's a little sing song, catchy phrase that that we would use to say, look, no, really, I'm really telling the truth. I don't know if you've ever heard a politician say, read my lips. OK, that's the, that's the kind of oath that's saying, hey, right now, I really mean what I say. There's a phrase that I that I use far too often. It's well, to be honest with you, and and I use that phrase, yes, to 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 give weight to what I'm about to say. But think about all of these oaths. If I say I swear on my grandma's grave or I pinky promise or uh, cross my heart, hope to die, stick a needle in my eye or well, to be honest with you. What do all of those oaths imply? All of those oaths imply that what I'm saying right now is the truth. And it implies that everything else that I say without that oath may not be the truth. 
That's a dangerous place to be. You know, sometimes people will, will make oaths and they'll say, it. well, I swear. And then they'll use God's name. I swear to, to the Lord. And, and it's a, a way misusing God's name that people will, will take and make oaths. A lot of time oaths are used to prop up the words that we say. To give them more weight and importance and believability. All right. There are a couple of things that, that James is really trying to combat here as he talks about making oaths. And one of them is lying. You know, a lot of times in, in a sea of lies, our society is accustomed to lying so much that if we want to share or speak the truth, we'll take an oath with it and we'll say, hey, well, to be honest with you, or I pinky promise, or I swear on my grandma's grave. All right, we say things to prop up our words in a sea of lies to where uh, they carry great importance. You know, lying. Lying is an age-old problem. Children don't have to be taught to lie. You know, I think of all three of my kids. I think of myself as I was young. Nobody ever had to sit down with me with a textbook and say, okay, so if you want to tell a good lie, these are the steps you need to take. I, it came natural to me, okay? I never had to be taught to lie. And, and we think that we're good at lying, and some people are good at lying. But we think that we're good at it. I remember as a kid, I would be amazed. I would tell a lie to my parents, and they'd say, mm, you're telling me a lie. Do you want to tell me the truth? And I would think or say to myself, oh, my goodness, my parents have some kind of superpower <laughs> How did my parents know that I was telling a lie? Because in my mind, I thought I was good at it and that I could get away with it. It was natural and it came naturally to me. Now that I'm a parent and my kids try to lie to me and I can tell they're shocked and they're like, how did they know I was lying? Well, do you know why? <laughs> because I tried to do it myself and I recognize a lot of those same patterns. So it, it, it comes naturally to lie. We don't have to be taught. But also, the, the problem of lying is, is universal. Paul says in Romans chapter 3, I want to I read a couple of verses to you. Verse 10, James says, None is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. And then in verse 13, so he says, Everybody is included in this. Then in verse 13, he says, Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. James says, hey, everybody, every man, woman, boy, and girl is in the same boat. You're deceitful. You use your lips and your tongue to deceive. So we don't have to be taught, and it's a universal problem, but also Jesus taught that Satan is the source in John 8, 44, it says, speaking of Satan, Jesus says he is a liar and the father of lies. So a lot of times uh, as we lie or, or we're surrounded by lies, we feel the need to take an oath or, or to make a vow on what we're saying in order to prop it up and to give it more believability. That's what James is talking about here when he says, don't, don't take an oath. Don't swear by anything in heaven or, or on the earth. You know, don't don't take those oaths. But he's not only addressing taking oaths to prop up lying and dishonesty. But James also is addressing the, the fact that the very oaths that people would take were, were they were duplicitous in nature. All right. They were the aim. The goal was to deceive or manipulate. So not only lying. But it's, it's very vague speech that we use as we make vows, as we try to prop up our lies or, or uh, differentiate our, our truth from lies. A lot of times people will, will use vague language to try to leave themselves an out. All right. An example of this kind of duplicitous speech, it's sneaky, it's deceptive. An example um, I, at one of the churches where I served, there, were, there was a group of college students that wanted to go on a retreat. They wanted to go to the beach, you know, and, and spend time, uh, do Bible studies, things like that, but go to the beach and have, have a good time at the beach uh, while we did a retreat. Well, in my mind and in my thought, I, I thought, you know, well, that money would be better spent going on a mission trip, you know, to serve. It, that would be more productive and beneficial. 
But do you know, you know, I, I liked these students and I didn't want to to just crush them with no. So as they as they brought this idea, I was talking to him and I said, well, you know, I, that's a possibility. So I used really vague language. All right. And, and I said, well, yeah, that, that's a possibility. Well, later on, I wasn't thinking about it, but it was it was a year or two later. And I was teaching in, in Sunday school and I said, you know, sometimes when people approach me with an idea uh, and, and I really don't want to do it, I said, you know, to not crush them or or, you know, really upset them or cause issues. I'll say, well, that, that's a possibility. And one of the girls said, wait, you said that a couple of years ago when we asked about doing a beach retreat and I was caught red handed. I said, I did. You know, and I, I used truthful language. Was it a possibility to go on that retreat? Yeah, for sure. Did I ever intend to do that? No, I did not. And I used duplicitous speech, ambiguous speech, speech that was very vague, and it was meant to be deceptive, and it was meant to mislead. It was meant to give me an out to where I could make a statement you know, but, but, but it left me some wiggle room. I, the Pharisees did this too, all right? So, so this vague oath-making or, or making statements that, that leave yourself some wiggle room, the Pharisees did that. Jesus, speaking to the Pharisees in Matthew 23, he says, Woe to you, blind guides, who say, If anyone swears by the temple, it is nothing. But if anyone swears by the gold of the temple, he is bound by his oath. You blind fools, for which is greater, the gold of the temple that is made or the temple that is made the gold sacred? And you say, if anyone swears by the altar, it is nothing. But if anyone swears by the gift that is on the altar, he is bound by his oath. So what was going on was, was the Pharisees came up with this system of taking and making oaths to where you could take an oath or you could swear on one thing and you weren't bound by it. It gave you some wiggle room. But if there were other things that you would swear by or take an oath by, then you were bound to follow through. All right. So it was it was this duplicitous speech to where you could swear by something that you were not bound to in order to prop your words up. But really, it was deceptive and sneaky trying to find your way out the back door. All right. Uh, I've done that before as a kid. Have you ever been been talking to somebody or making a promise to somebody and it was something that you didn't want to do? All right. And, and as you were talking to them, you would would tell them, well, I'll give you a hundred dollars for da, 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 you know, and they were like, OK, well, wow. And then when they turned around, you had your fingers crossed. Have you ever done that? And you said, yeah, you know, I, I used to do that with my brothers and sisters all the time. Hey, if you'll clean the bathroom for me right now, then I'll load the dishwasher for you tonight after supper. And they'd say, really? And I'd say, yeah, yeah, I, yes. And I would get them to clean the bathroom, but I had my fingers crossed. So it came time to load the dishwasher after supper. And I'd say, nope, my fingers were crossed. Okay, I don't know if you've ever done that, but, but I have. It's the same thought that the Pharisees have right here. To where they're saying, look, you can make an oath, but you can get out of it too. That's what James is talking about when he says, don't make an oath. Because we use oaths to prop up our dishonesty. We use them to differentiate in a sea of lies. You know, to give weight to the things that we say. But James says, not only do you do that, but the way that you take oaths, it's crafty and it's sneaky. It's meant to deceive and mislead. And he says, hey... That's not the way that your speech should be as a follower of Jesus Christ. Our society is so accustomed to lying and duplicitous speech that, that we almost expect an oath when somebody is actually really communicating the truth. We're conditioned to be skeptical, to take it with a grain of salt, sometimes the things that people say, because we almost just expect people to try to, to try to turn their words and get out of it, or for it to be a lie to start with. There are certain professions that we expect it from. All right, I love Gallup polls. 
Gallup does surveys and, and collect all this data. Well, one survey that they do every year is on uh, occupations that are the most trustworthy or honest. All right. And, and I love seeing these numbers every year. Um, they, they fascinate me a little bit. So as, as they polled Americans to try to find out uh, the most trustworthy and honest professions, occupations, um, nurses ranked the highest. 85% of the people polled and surveyed gave nurses either a high or very high mark for trustworthiness and honesty. So all of these are going to be based on high or very high ratings. So there, there were very high, high, average, low, and very low. All right, those were your options. So these are high or very high. Nurses were 85%. Engineers were 66%. Doctors at 65%. And dentists at 61%. So if you're in healthcare or an engineer, you're seen to be pretty trustworthy. On the opposite side of the coin, all right, those that we expect duplicitous speech or lying, you know, trying to build up and prop up that can't be trusted. On the other side, bankers, only 28% rated bankers high or very high in honesty. Lawyers, only 22% considered uh, bankers to be honest or trustworthy. Politicians, between, between 12 and 13 percent. And car sales, 9 percent trustworthy. All right. I, so I'm, I'm fascinated that, that we as people are conditioned to expect dishonesty. We're conditioned to expect lies or, or trying to prop up with, with you know, oaths or, or untruth to have duplicitous speech that's vague and, and leaves wiggle room or an out. All right, we expect it. Clergy. Clergy fall right in the middle kind of of those groups. Clergy, only 40% of people, 40% rated clergy high or very high. That's a problem. Okay, and I think that Christians would, would kind of fall right in there. So not just pastors, not just clergy, but, but Christians in general. That's a, that's a reflection on many of us. As I look at these numbers, it concerns me a little bit that I, on the trustworthy scale of people, I am closer to a lawyer than I am to even a dentist. All right, that's a... Uh, I don't think that's a very good place to be. But with these thoughts, we condition ourselves with the with the, the idea or the notion that we need to take an oath, that we need to prop up the things that we say so that so that they would be believable to people. But, you know, what's really at hand, the real root issue as we, we see the need to speak an oath or to expect others to use them, it reveals deeper issues. Remember, James is writing to believers. And as followers of Christ, our speech reflects onto Jesus. Other people, whether we like it or not, other people base their thoughts and opinions on, of Jesus Christ on the speech and actions and attitudes of his followers. And that's the entirety of the book of James. James says, hey, if you're in Christ, you should have living faith to where what Christ produces, who Christ is, should be the way of your life. And your life should align with Jesus Christ. But instead, a lot of times it doesn't. When we feel the need to prop up our speech with oaths, there's a disconnect between professed faith and actions. And James is saying, hey, there's got to be alignment in the things that you say because you are a follower of Christ. So instead of lying, deceitful, duplicitous speech, instead of playing a game, trying to be really vague with words and trying to find a way that you can get out the back door and get out of things, 
When we prop our words up by making oaths, we often are trying to make the things that we say believable. But as a follower of Christ, our goal should not be for our speech to be believable. As a follower of Christ, our goal must be for the things that we say to be truthful. And there's a difference there. Oaths are need, their oaths are needed in our mind to prop up and to make our speech believable. But to be truthful, to have speech that is distinctive and countercultural, an oath is not a way to get there. Saying, I swear on my grandma's grave, there's no room for that as a believer of Christ. Our speech must be characterized by honesty and integrity. With simplicity and clarity, James says, let your yes be yes and your no be no. James is saying, hey, say what you mean and mean what you say. Speak simply. Speak clearly. Be honest in the way that you communicate and you use your words. Our speech should be characterized by dependability and consistency. To where it's trustworthy. As followers of Christ, how do we do that? How do we let our yes be yes and our no be no? How do we remove the need and the idea that, that we should prop up our words by taking oaths? What's the solution? The solution is to run to Jesus Christ. Because in a relationship with him, remember, Jesus teaches in John 15, Jesus is the vine and we are the branches. If we abide in him, Jesus says that we'll bear much fruit. And do you know what? If we abide in him and we bear fruit, it's going to be the same fruit that Jesus produced. All right. The vine is not going to have a branch that produces a different kind of fruit than what the vine produces. Jesus says, if you abide in me, you're going to produce fruit, the kind of fruit that I bear. So honesty in speech, integrity in speech, simplicity and clarity in speech, dependability, consistency, trustworthiness in speech. When we run to Jesus and we abide in him and we abide in his word, God transforms our hearts and lives to be more like Jesus, to where our speech reflects on and becomes more like Jesus. As we're transformed and our speech is transformed, our speech will no longer need, need to be propped up. It will no longer need to be um, duplicitous to leave us a way out. But as we abide in Jesus Christ, our speech will reflect the truth, the integrity, and the perfect beauty of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what James calls us to. James says, hey, you're in Christ. Let your speech reflect it. So taking oaths, be wary. Be wary because it implies that there's dishonesty in other areas. James says, align your life with Jesus Christ. Let your speech reflect his beauty and his perfection. Let's pray. God, what a challenge it is to think about how our words reflect on Jesus Christ. God, forgive me for times when my attitudes and speech are ugly and they reflect in an ugly way on Jesus Christ. God, I ask that you would help my speech to be transformed, that I wouldn't feel the need to, to make an oath or take an oath or, or to say, well, to be honest with you. But God, help my speech to be honest all the time. Help my speech to be of, of integrity and simplicity and clarity. Help my speech to be trustworthy and consistent, dependable. So that as a follower of Christ, my speech would reflect on the perfect nature and beauty and consistency of my Lord Jesus Christ. God, I ask that you would transform our tongues by transforming our hearts through our relationship with Jesus. In his name I pray, amen.